After 50 years of darkness, Guta Tirangel Benezra was finally able to depict her tragic past. Her repressed memory became a cascade of creativity in the form of paintings, poems, and narratives, which enabled her to relive the horrific events of the Holocaust that had wiped out her family and many, many others from the face of the earth. How could you speak? What would you say? That Russia is still burning. Moshe runs like a rat. And Esther breathes out vengeance on your part. For all others, howling in your ears. How could you speak when you want to scream? Laugh, eat, dance, with darkness in the corners of your life. Blowing out the screws of amnesic memory, bursting volcanic truth of pettiness, witness of grief, of undying memory. And the world turned upside down. Humans change into animals. And the cruelest among them took charge and the justice enslaved twisted its blind head. יום אחד אני יצאתי לשוק וראיתי שמובילים חסידים ובאותו יום ירד גשם והושיבו את כל החסידים בתוך השלולית ואני עמדתי והסתכלתי כמו שאני מסתכלת אני רואה שני גרמנים הולכים ושניים אחרים עם ‫טהר, ומוציאים את הרף ‫וגוזזים את זקנו של הרף. ‫ואני עמדתי והסתכלתי, ‫וכל כך נדהמתי מזה, ‫והדהים אותי עוד יותר שהרף לא בכה, ‫אלא אמר, תתפללו, תשאירו, ‫תשאירו, תתפללו. ‫ואני רצתי הביתה, ‫פתחתי את הדלת ונתתי צעקה, ‫סבתא, אין אלוהים בשמיים. ‫הסבתא שאלה אותי, ‫מה קרה לך, נכדתי? ‫אז סיפרתי לה, ‫אז היא אמרה לי, ‫לא את תשפטי את מעשה אלוהים. ‫אם אלוהים ראה ולא העניש את הגרמנים ‫והרב לא בכה, ‫סימן שאנחנו קרובים לגאולה. ‫ואת, נכדתי, תשבי לידי ‫ותתפללי לנשמתו של הרב. ‫אני מספרת לך היום ‫שאני ישבתי ליד סבתא, ‫אבל לא התפללתי. ‫מאותו יום לא התפללתי יותר, ‫כי חשבתי... שלו היה אלוהים בשמיים, היה מסנוור את עיני הגרמנים, או היה משתק את ידיהם, ואם הוא לא עשה כלום, סימן שאין אלוהים. The train of extermination vibrates with grief, the complaint of humiliation, on silence, on the veil, bleeding and streaming, the tears wrapped in desperate soul. buried the memory of destroyed ties, uncovered the unspeakable truth of lost innocence and mortified childhood. I was crying immediately when somebody would ask me how did I survive. I was irritated by uh, the absence of knowledge about the events. I was somehow unable to communicate on this subject, but I knew and I felt all the time I had to do something about this because I had the impression I could not leave all these thousands of people, hundreds of my own family, to be left without any memory, any traces, anything that would be left. And I had the impression that if I'm not doing this, The final solution somehow for them would have been consumed. On the 25th of October, 1940, the day before the birth of Guta, her family and all the other Jews of the shtetl of Minsk Mazovetsky were confined by the SS in a ghetto. Jews had no way out and Christian Poles had no way in. Miriam Karmi was 17 years old. 
She is one of the very few survivors of the 7,000 who were there at that time. On the 21st of August, 1942, the liquidation of the ghetto took place. 1,000 were killed on the spot. Moshe and Rachel Tirangel and their two babies, Guta and Esther, survived the action by hiding in the hydraulic tower. About 5,500 were sent to the Treblinka death camp and gassed immediately. The remaining 500 separated and wandered in the surroundings, trying to survive. <laughs> Two hundred and eighty skilled Jews were officially registered in a working camp called Kopernik, surrounded by walls. Other survivors sneaked in by bribing the SS guards. Until Christmas 1942, there were a few hundreds of illegals who were frequently executed and buried in the Jewish cemetery. I know from uh, what was said to me afterwards that my mother, with the two baby, went back or went after some weeks of wandering around and hiding different places, went back to the Copernic camp, the working camp. Sandwich, 
Several children were taken out of the Copernic camp and entrusted into the hands of Christian Poles who were risking their life by hiding them. Most children were found and killed, yet three baby girls survived, Guta, Dana, and Barbara. The two Berger sisters were saved by a Catholic woman from Minsk, Mazowiecki. Her name is Apollonia Chmielewska. I think it was not a moment of hesitation on her part that it was her mission to uh, save us. I think that my survival is really due to the friendship. Because if uh, our adoptive mother saved us, it's because of her love and friendship with our mother. I was taken out of this Copernic camp on the 26th of October, 1942, because I was told it was my second birthday when the Christian family, which accepted to take care of me, for some temporary hiding with the help of notary and the, the priest that gave me the full certificate with the name of Genoveva Filipiak, which was the name of the cousin of this family. Their name was Jujo and Bronya Yashtuk. They were saying to the neighbors that I was a niece because they were already 40 years old and they could not have a small baby suddenly. My sister was also taken out. We were supposedly thrown out of the uh, wall with the wicker basket. And these things were organized by the newly cre created Help Jegota, which was the organization of Christian and Jews that were trying to save some of the children because the children in this working camp were not allowed to be because they were supposed to be killed already. The lady that uh, took us in couldn't keep us with her because uh, right away, uh, some Poles were trying to blackmail her to get money uh, under the menace that they will denounce her, that she had Jewish children with her. So uh, very soon, I think, uh, in a few days, she had to arrange some other hidden places. Uh, and uh, she arranged for my sister, who was a baby, and Luckily for her, these things counted at this time. She was blonde with blue eyes. Hmm. Talking about such banal detail, I am moved. It's very sad that the color of your eyes or your hair can save your life. When I was taken to this Christian family, my mother was still alive. And my father also was in some organization, some resistant organization. I don't know exactly how and where he was hiding and surviving. If he was also in Copernic, if he was in another place where 150 working uh, Jewish, Jewish men were employed. But I'm, I know that he was alive until February 94, and then he went to Warsaw Ghetto. My mother was burned alive with other people in the Copernic camp on the 10th of January 43, when the people refused to get out of their building because they knew they were going to be shut, shut in the cemetery and they've started a resistance. They uh, were throwing the, everything they had under the, on, under the hand, everything like stones or any heavy objects they were throwing on the uh, Germans. And the Germans realized that they couldn't get them out. They put the fire and they burned them alive.
Ja nie widziałam, bo ja się tam bałam podejść. To było okropne. Krzyk był słychać na, u nas, na zgodę ulicy. To tylko ja z, słyszałam z ulicy zgoda. Jaki krzyk? Krzyk ten, jak zaczęli podpalać, to przecież tak. pani wie, jaki był krzyk tam? Taki jęk. O Boże, co to się działo? Co to się działo? To pani to nie... długo było, długo trwało. Dwa Ach. dni, tak? Pani to, było, to było okropne. To było okropne. Then I stayed with this family, but they were in danger because some neighbors denounced them as having a Jewish child. And she was brought by Gestapo and in prison. When uh, her husband, Jujo, came from work and found me in the cave and Bronia in the uh, prison, he organized help from whoever he can and they bribe uh, the chief and they get her out. They freed him, her. But from this moment, they were afraid that next chief that will come will have to be bribed or will do the same. Or this one maybe could not be bribed and therefore they were risking the life for all the family and everyone who helped. Then they took their luggages and they went in the surrounding villages to hide with me. We were walking, sleeping here and there. They were having some food. And they were working in different farms in order to survive. Irit Romano was 13 years old. Left all alone, she wandered from farm to farm in the area of Minsk Mazowiecki until she was accepted in a convent. She had a fake baptism certificate and had already learned all the Catholic prayers. הייתי יושבת בכנסייה על ספסל או קורה ברכיי ומבקשת מישו שיעזור לי לחיות ומבקשת ממנו שייעץ לי מה לעשות. אני לא צריכה להגיד לך שלשמור בסוד כל כך הרבה שנים שאני יהודייה ולא לספר לאף אחד אפשר להתפוצץ אז כשהייתי בשדה עם הפרות, הייתי מספרת לאוזן של הפרה, הייתי מספרת. ופה זה היה נהדר. When the Minsk Mazowiecki was liberated, it was in the spring of 44, they relaxed a little bit, but they still had difficulties to be with a Jewish baby because the population during the five years of war was subject to such a hate propaganda by Germans. And in the meantime, they got a lot of properties, Jewish properties. They were living in the houses which were abandoned by the Jewish families. Therefore, by cupidity, by newly or old hatred against the Jews, the Jewish survivors were not safe, even after the war. Well, with a baby it was different. I was looking like an Aryan. I was having a green eyes and blonde hair. But still, they were hostility toward this family and myself from children, from other neighbors. And I felt not safe at all. Uh, children are very cruel usually, and whatever is different, they would pick up on it. I didn't suffer too much of it because somehow my survival skills are good enough, I guess, so I, I managed to, to always, I don't know, function the way that I wouldn't antagonize people or that I would have this comfortable position when I'm not attacked. 
as a child and later teaching at the law school, still I would be exposed to it. So, for instance, at the law school, I managed always to stay away from any power position, like not to be on anybody else's uh, uh, way. I would do my thing. At school, it was maybe uh, some other strategy. I was very good uh, student, very, very good. So I would make sure that people depended on me, that they were needing me. So, and I was popular, and uh, so I didn't suffer much of, of the anti-Semitic attacks like someone else could. In 45, the only surviving member of my family came back from Russia. and uh, tried to take me out of this family, but I was with them already for two years, three years, and I felt safe with them. They loved me, and uh, they didn't want to part with me. I didn't, also because I was afraid of Jews. I thought the Jews were chased, they were killed, they were something bad. And if I was a Jew, I would be killed. Therefore, as a child, I took the position that I want to be where the safety is. I didn't have a Sudan, but I wanted to take it. And he, from the side, he loved Kenya, because he didn't have children. כמו אבא. אני ביקשתי ממנו שהוא יצא לי, שנשארתי לבד, אז הוא כמעט בחר והביא לי סכין. הוא לא כמעט, הוא בחר להביא סכין ומספר אמר, תהרוג אותי ואני לא יכול. I didn't want to go with my uncle. He made some trials to the family, did not succeed. I told to the judge, I don't want to go with him, and I told him I don't like Jews, I don't want to be Jewish. He left, and I was adopted by this family, and from this moment when I was adopted officially, I changed the name, became Genoveva Yashtu, or Genya Yashtu. I had a communion, Christian communion, and I started to live in more normal circumstances as a Christian child. I was brought up uh, as a Polish Catholic child. I was brought up in uh, Catholic tradition, knowing all the time that uh, my parents were Jewish. And somehow it felt very normal that I was Polish of Jewish origin or descent. To me, it was something like totally normal at, 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 at that time to be Polish and Jewish. Being Jewish didn't mean much that time because there was not like a meaning to it. I mean, I knew I was Jewish well, because our parents were killed by, by the Germans because they were Jewish. But what that really meant, it was that, well, some people would call us names occasionally, or we knew there was some anti-Semitism around, but it didn't mean much. We, we were not, I was not brought up in a Jewish context. Uh, we didn't have any Jewish life uh, there at that time. And therefore, I was really Polish, knowing that I was Jewish. Like many other Jewish children hidden by Christian families, Irit Romano's prayer from home had become a genuine Christian prayer. Convinced it was her faith, she decided to go to the Mother Superior and become a Christian. The night of the big decision, she had a dream. I went to the store and I'm in the store. And the store is a big one. I went to the store and I want to buy the store. And then I saw three פרחים רוקדים, והם רוקדים, ואני מתקרבת אליהם והם בורחים. אני מתקרבת והם בורחים. ואני רואה שזה לא פרחים, שזה החיות שלי. ואני רואה שכל פרח 
זה פנים של אחות שלי. ואני צועקת, טובה, אתה, חיה, חכו לי. ואני רואה שאני רצה בכל כוחי, והם בורחים. והם בורחים, ופתאום נפתחים השמיים. ואני רואה חור כזה גדול בשמיים, והחור בשמיים, הוא... אני רואה ראשים. אני רואה את הראש של אימא, ואבא, וסבא וסבתא, וכולם עושים לי לא. לא. ואני צועקת, אני צועקת, ואני מתעוררת. אני מתעוררת, ואמרתי לא, אני הולכת לאימא מנזר, ואני הולכת לספר לה. בינתיים, איך נודע לה, אני הולכת לאימא מנזר, ופתאום היא קוראת לי אימא מנזר. קוראת לי, ואומרת לי, בואי. היא הכניסה אותי לחדר שלה, חדר הקבלה. את יודעת, להיכנס לחדר הקבלה שלה זה כמו להגיע לאפיפיור, לאלוהים. זה היה גדול. היא הייתה כזאת גדולה, ענקית כזאת, והכובע הגדול הזה. והיה לה צרור המפתחות, וכל פעם שהיא הלכה, הלוך ושר, עם צרור המפתחות, רק הצליל הפחיד אותי. והיא אומרת לי, שבי, וככה אני התיישבתי. אז היא פתאום שואלת, תגידי, זה נכון? אמרתי לה, אימא מנזר, מה נכון? נכון מה ששמעתי? אמרתי לה, אבל אני לא יודעת מה, חשבתי שאולי עשית מה. היא אומרת לי, נכון שאת יהודייה? אמרתי לה, נכון, אני יהודייה. אז היא אומרת לי, אין דבר, לא קרה כלום. אף אחד במנזר לא יודע שאת יהודייה. ביום ראשון ניסע לוורשה, אני אנצר אותך ותמשיכי להיות אצלנו. ותראי, שנים חשבתי לבוא אליה ולהגיד לה, אבל ברגע שהיא אמרה לי, התקוממתי. אני הרגשתי שכופים עליי, שמכריחים אותי, ואמרתי לה, לא, אני לא מתנצלת. ופה יש איזה רגע שאחרי שנים אני בעצמי ניתחתי אותו. אני רציתי להתנצר מרצוני הטוב, אבל לא שמישהו בא ואומר לי, אני אנצר אותך. אמרתי לה, לא. ואז היא התחילה להתקיף אותי. איך את מעיזה לא להתנצר? איך את יכולה היום, היום, ככה להליב את ישו? הלו, את פגעת בו. את אכלת לחם קודש בלי להתנצר. אז עצרתי אותה ואמרתי לה, אימא מנזר, ישו יסלח לי, כי רציתי לחיות. גוטה גרו אפ כמו קריסטיאן צ'יילד עם חברה אדופטיב פולש פמילי. היא אקסלת בספורט והיא חברה של פולנד נשיונל טים של אתלטיקס. ב-1961 היא הייתה נכנסת לבחור את הדיסטנט היהודית היהודית במס. היא הייתה נכנסת את המשחק. Then, her Jewish soul took over, in spite of the normality mask she was wearing at the time. When I went to France and they looked at me, I was for them shikse, which means a, a, a negative kind of goya, negative gentile, with blonde hair, makeup, uh, behaving in very uh, assured way. studying law, and I have developed a kind of arrogant posture because I was the champion of Poland, and I was the beautiful girl that everybody was admiring, and not the one that was the child crying and left after everybody had died. And this new personality, this family didn't like, and I didn't like them because they were also very ordinary. and um, didn't have any appeal to me. Somehow I was there for about two, three weeks, and they were pushing, pressing me to stay and to become Jewish. And I was resisting, but at the same time being tempted by this. And one day I went to a neighbor, and she put a record of Hasidic Jewish traditional music, and I had a very incredible reaction.
totally uncontrolled sobbing for many hours. And I had the impression that all the repressed feelings, all the lamentation came back into me. And this injustice of being obliged to become another person, to forget my family. came back to me spontaneously, and I said, I want to stay, I want to be a Jewish. When my memory became painting, freed from constraints and inhibitions, I was finally able to picture my deadly past. Mental images sparked with the book's force, uncontrolled and powerful. Broken silence spoke its words of outrage and distress. Facing disbelief, hidden feelings flashed out into the light to unmask. I had by chance uh, went, I by chance went to a um, watercolors class and I bought my colors, I bought my brushes. On the third lesson, I started to paint the things which didn't have anything to do with the lesson was, was given to me. And also nothing to do with the level in which I was. I was painting like in a trance and the images which were going, which were painted, were directly coming from my memory from my emotional memory, from anything that was inscribed somewhere in my childhood, in my story from the first 10 years of my life. It was nothing intellectual, nothing planned, and without any training, any formation, any special interest, I was able to get out images that speak to me, the whole story that I did not want to remember. It's mystifying me. It's really mystifying me. How come I know what to do? And who is dictating? Who is saying to me, you know, how to, hand, how to handle the brush, how to mix the colors, how to know uh, what to put first and when the second, and how to make the forms, because I never drew. I didn't know how to draw. When I look at my paintings, I have the words coming spontaneously without thinking, without looking at the dictionary. And what is strange, I can write in Polish sometimes without any planning before, or in English or in French. And it comes somehow without me knowing why I did write in English, why I did write in French. And they are different. Guta went to Chamonix to discuss with Professor Anne Ancelin Schutzenberger, the founder of Transgenerational Psychology, whom she met recently in Montreal. She told her that she started to paint on the 26th of October, 1992, exactly 50 years, day by day, from the separation with her parents. She wrote her first poem in Polish on the 50th anniversary of her mother's death. Que vous avez vécu, c'est peut-être ce que nous nous appelons un syndrome d'anniversaire. Quelquefois 50 ans ou 30 ans, souvent 50 ans, on le voit après un événement, c'est comme si une crypte enfouie dont le deuil non fait d'un événement tragique se rouvrait et il en sortait comme un fantôme qui s'exprime. Et pour vous, ce serait peut-être la peinture, vous m'avez fait passer quelques photos de vos peintures et on a l'impression qu'on voit un fantôme dessus. Et donc on est obligé d'émettre l'hypothèse que peut-être votre mère ou vos parents ont été tués ou massacrés de façon horrible et que ce fantôme vous hante et est sorti de la crypte et vous le représente. Comme si quand il y avait des choses trop tragiques et totalement inadmissibles qui étaient arrivées pour une, un individu ou une famille, un choc trop grand, comme un meurtre, un assassinat, un génocide, 
un viol, euh, des choses comme ça. On n'en parlait pas et c'était devenu un non-dit ou un secret qui était enterré comme dans une crypte à l'intérieur des descendants et dont pouvait sortir comme un fantôme hein, qui hantait et parlait pour les gens. Et il vient de sortir un livre qui s'appelle « L'enfant de remplacement euh, » du professeur Porot. Et il dit que l'enfant de remplacement a le choix entre la psychose et la créativité artistique. Et il me semble que vous, vous avez choisi la créativité artistique. Donc ça s'inscrit tout à fait dans euh, quelque chose que nous connaissons bien maintenant. Il y a quelque chose que je dois comprendre moi-même. Because I'm painting for me also. I'm painting like to remember me some of the events, some of the feelings, some of the things I am. And therefore, afterwards, it takes me a long, long time to, to look at my paintings and to see what it remem reminds me, what kind of events, concrete events, and what kind of feelings, and what it means for me, because these feelings were in me. And it's important for me to, to get acquainted with them, to face them, to understand them, and then to leave it as a trace of what I have gone through and what especially my mother, my father went through, because I'm sure I have their feelings also somewhere inscribed in me. And the, the, the things I've seen, it was the things I was, was were outside me. Uh, the screams, the fri frightened looks that you can see in my paintings are the looks of the people I was watching, not necessarily my own mirror, because my own mirror, maybe some of the paintings are also kind of expression of what I was when I was a child, living among a hostile population and hiding and feeling like unworthy of life. I'm always this double person. I'm always this child that is painting and writing poetry. And I'm a person who is educated intellectual that tries to rationalize and to understand what is coming out. And I'm surprised that some of the symbols come like from a folkloric or mystical or mysterious Kabbalistic, Jewish uh, legends and touching the subjects which are typically an interpretation of the Jewish Hasidic legends. And these things, I never acquired them. I never learned them because this type of things usually you acquire when you're a child. And I was a, among, living among Polish Christian uh, children and not among the Jewish. There was no Jews around me. So I'm still a secular Jew and not a believer and I don't have any religious faith. And I still, in fact, a little bit uh, resistant to this part of uh, the Jewish tradition, which is a religious one, because I don't feel authentic inside. Twice in her life, Guta was overwhelmed while trying to connect to her Jewish identity. She went to seek some answers from Professor Ira Robinson, a Canadian expert on Jewish mysticism. Scholars looking at the phenomenon of secular Jews, secular Judaism, Judaism uh, Jews who don't have or don't feel they have any real actual substantial connection with Judaism as a religion. Nonetheless, many scholars have looked at prominent Jewish personalities like this and have seen very much a connection with the Jewish mystical tradition. Books have been written about Sigmund Freud and the Jewish mystical tradition, though the one thing you can say about Sigmund Freud is he was no Jewish mystic. Book, a book has been recently written on Franz Kafka and the Jewish mystical tradition. Jewish women 
did not have access to the book learning that the that was the ideal for Jewish men. Nonetheless, they sustained a rich a, a rich spiritual life for themselves. On est un certain nombre à travailler sur ce qu'on appelle le transgénérationnel. Et le transgénérationnel qui a commencé à être travaillé par Nicolas Abraham, mais par d'autres aussi, c'est ce qui se passe de non digéré et non métabolisé et qui passe directement, comme une diarrhée si vous voulez, d'une génération à l'autre ou à la troisième, comme en cascade, avec une série de traumatismes. Alors que quand les choses peuvent être parlées, elles sont ce que nous appelons un intergénérationnel, c'est-à-dire que par exemple, dans la famille Bach, où on était doué pour le, la musique, eh bien on parlait de la musique, on enseignait la musique, et c'était transmis d'une génération à l'autre. Alors que le transgénérationnel est transmis sans mots et inconsciemment, comme quelque chose d'indigeste, de non digéré, non métabolisé, et qui pèse d'un poids de cauchemar et de difficulté, ou de maladie, ou de mort précoce. Je ne travaille pas avec le paranormal, je ne travaille pas avec la vie avant la vie, je, ou après la vie, je ne travaille moins qu'au niveau personnel, familial et historique. Et ça me paraît fascinant de retrouver les dates historiques frais et de s'apercevoir que c'est au moment où il y a, on trouve un syndrome d'anniversaire, souvent l'année, la période et très souvent jour pour jour. I believe there is an explanation, possible explanation, but it's not proved uh, by any science. It's that somehow our genetic material have a part of the collective memory somewhere expressed through the genetic inheritance. Souls are portable and uh, within the Jewish tradition in, and particularly within the Kabbalistic tradition it's believed that it's possible for one to possess either a recycled soul, a soul that has had a bodily existence or existences previous to this. It's possible as well to be for one body to share, to, to share space with several souls, where this process is called ibur, which means in Hebrew literally pregnancy, where after all a pregnant woman is sharing her body with another being. There, there are cases invoked by Kabbalists of Magidim, that is, angels who are giving ideas, instructions. I did find, I think, was that there was a surface meaning to what you were writing and what you were painting. And I could certainly detect beneath that a, a certain spiritual power. Full of dreams, dust and void. They were blamed for their fate. Shameful, frightful memory, pounding on the bottom preserved its way. Sounds of music wandered, hardening its play, bleeding cord endured by freezing cranes sang with solemn voices its true content. I would have joined you in your abyss, living fear and distress, flying free to the moon 
talking with your smile and also to the sun warm with your tender arms. I knew you watched my way through this difficult path of too many dead to witness and cry. Ces images imprimées sur quatre générations, vous, vous les avez directement. Ce serait intéressant. Ce qu'il y a, c'est que si vous les peignez, si vous en parlez à des gens qui, comme moi, sont capables de le comprendre, vous délivrez vos enfants et petits-enfants de la nécessité de rêver ces cauchemars, puisqu'on va pouvoir le métaboliser, c'est-à-dire en parler. Pouvoir nommer l'horreur, parler l'horreur, palérer l'horreur. C'est-à-dire que je pense que vous allez continuer à créer tout ça jusqu'à ce que vous fassiez le deuil de la perte de votre mère et de ce coin de Pologne et de tout ce massacre et de ce génocide. Et il faut que vous fassiez ce deuil pour délivrer vos petits-enfants. I have somehow connected my will to talk about this with the deposit of what has been uh, seen and felt and I decided now to bring it outside that the suffering and these incredible injustices would not be forgotten, that they will serve as a kind of reminder to the humanity that every day we can face again and we are facing this, this ha hatred that could be transformed something so cruel and the indifference of others that could have all kinds of justification in order not to help and not to become aware that under cer certain circumstances every society could become violent, unjust and prompt to, to do such a horrible act. Graveyard of my shtetl Floating in a foul air, their immolated bodies stay forever there. Half a century I bore my intense grief of such a tragic absence for no reason for it. I rejected this pain so impossible to scrape in other lands where I went on their pretense to live. Miosotis among trash, soul like moon. Tak. Tu mieszkał tu w Mińsku, taki Dajblum się nazywał, tak. Szklarz, tak. to często tu przyjeżdżał, tak, dobry dla znajomych, Aha. przyjeżdżał, no a tak to co, zarosło wszystko, ale jednego w zeszłym roku, czy dwa lata temu, ta, temu to wojsko powycinało, wszystko u porządek zrobili, tak. a w tym roku jakoś tak na razie może na wiosnę.
בכל השנה.